My name is Tim Denson. Um, I am on the board of the Federation of Neighborhoods, and I'll be facilitating tonight. Um, I also do work uh, for Advantage at the Homeless Day Service Center with uh, our homeless community, but I'm going to be sticking into the role of facilitator since we have this fantastic panelist here who are gonna be able to uh, talk more about what's going on. Uh, first here, we have Lillian Sronkowski. Yes, all right, pretty, uh, she's just saying that, I did okay. Um, who, is, uh, who is the um, homelessness uh, specialist with uh, athens Clark County Government and the, and the Housing Community Development. And we also have uh, Mike Moss, who uh, works over at the Homeless Day Service Center um, and uh, is an extraordinaire, and maybe he'll tell you about some of his fantastic dance move de-escalations he can do too. Um, and then we have John Morris, uh, who is also with uh, uh, Advantage Street Outreach and is the president, correct, chair of, uh, yeah, yeah, of the Athens Homeless Coalition uh, right now. Um, so, uh, Folks, I'm, I'm just going to throw it over to you at first. We're going we're to start this off with just some uh, facilitated questions that they got in advance that we'll talk about. And the second half of the forum will be uh, questions from the audience, and we'll have more of a discussion there. So uh, just to kick us off, I'm going to ask this, each of y'all to uh, talk about uh, just briefly your role and, and when it comes to uh, working with uh, the homeless community here and how you got involved in that. Hi, y'all. So um, the uh, Housing and Community Development Department at, at uh, athens Clark County Government, um, we don't provide any direct service, but we do fund organizations who do provide those direct services to the community. So athens Clark County receives um, CDBG or Community Block Development Grant funds that can fund home projects that um, apply to homelessness as well as home dollars and then Continuum of Care as well as ARPA, which is American Rescue Plan dollars attached to our homeless strategic plan and those dollars can be um, given out to different organizations in the community based on competitive request for project grants and then ACC gov through the housing and community development department we manage those grants um, and then provide technical assistance and um, do several kinds of data projects throughout the year to ensure that you know we're putting accurate data out to the community on homelessness those kinds of things So yeah, my name is Mike Moss. Uh, I'm the engagement specialist at uh, Advantage Homeless Day Service Center. Uh, my person, long-term recovery, uh, not only from chemical dependency and uh, mental health issues, but also from homelessness. Uh, before I came into recovery 22 months ago, I was in a mix between living out in the woods of Franklin and Haversham counties and couch surfing as long as they would have me. But uh I actually started as a client of Advantage, and then uh, I guess about six months ago, a little over six months ago, I applied for a job with John and the outreach team, uh, which I didn't get, but they did uh, recommend me for another position, and that's the engagement specialist at the Day Services Center. Uh, and what I do in that position is basically I'm pretty much the first line of communication for our clients when they come to uh to gain our services for their needs, specific needs, uh, showers, laundry, food, clothing, uh, mailing address, use of a phone, sometimes the internet. And my ultimate goal uh, almost every day aside from that is to help as many of them find their way into recovery as possible. Uh, pretty much it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name's John Morris. I serve as the community programs team lead at Advantage. So I oversee our street outreach program as well as our current hotel voucher program, um, which is nearing the end of its life, but we have, it was a COVID funded project, but um, we have um, some additional dollars that we've worked out with the county to help facilitate the first step um, closure and uh, helping kind of transition folks from there into the hotel and, and ideally into housing from there. Um, in street outreach, our team is out in the woods, out in camps. We're downtown, we're under bridges, we're wherever unhoused folks are living at, meeting them where they're at, 
and trying to build strong relationships and connection with them. Uh, we have four core values, empathy, honesty, autonomy, and advocacy. We believe that if we can connect with clients um, on an emotional level and personal level, um, we can help them make autonomous choices, understand what choices they have and make autonomous choices um, for themselves. And we communicate with honesty and recognize that um, as advocates, we might be able to help them open doors that um, systemic barriers might prevent them from opening on their own. Um, and then I also sit as the current and outgoing chair soon of the Athens Homeless Coalition. Um, if you haven't kept up with the Homeless Coalition, it's kind of historically been a volunteer-run group of individuals, mostly service providers, kind of fulfilling, checking the boxes of what um, HUD requires us as a community to do to receive um, a certain set of grant dollars called Continuum of Care grant dollars. Um, we have spent this year really digging deep into community and how can we as a community um, be more involved. And I, there's certainly a lot of animosity and opinions about homelessness and how our community is responding to homelessness. So how can we um, use that tension and energy to work together towards what are real um, effective solutions that help get people off our streets um, and into housing and into um, successful lives that they want to live. So um, thanks for having us tonight, Tim. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all for being here. And also, uh, I just want to point out, um, Jamie Scott with Sparrow's Nest was really wanting to be here, uh, but uh, he's not feeling well, so we not able to meet with us tonight. Um, but we will push forward. Um, and so I think Building on, um, John, especially where you're going there uh, with, with your answer, you know, uh, our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness are often, you know, referred to as statistic or in more in personal ways, which it it's, makes it more difficult maybe for um, all of us to be able to empathize and be able to effectively think about how we can address homelessness. So I wonder if all of y'all can just talk about, um, you know, really who these people are and what are some of the situations that, that you often see that lead to them experiencing homelessness? Okay. Uh, from my experience, they're people. At some point in time, no different than anyone else in this room, somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's child to begin with, brothers, sisters, family members, friends, of course, uh, for many of them, uh, there was a life before homelessness. Very few that I've met were born into it. One of the, uh, one of the things I've heard a lot about misconceptions, I think is the proper term is that, uh, pretty much the homeless are homeless by choice. I know my experience was that I did make some bad decisions and I chose to walk away from a life. Uh, however, once you make that decision, you can't just unchoose it. It's not just as simple as saying, okay, so now I choose to go back. So I don't believe anyone's necessarily homeless by choice. Uh, that stated, there are so, there, I call it the trifecta. So many of, of these neighbors um, have mental health issues to go along with their homelessness. I've seen firsthand in the last six months several cases of full-blown schizophrenia. Uh, and then you add substance abuse on top of that for many cases. Uh, again, bad choices to begin with, never a choice to continue in my experience. But ultimately, uh, the rock bottom line answer to that question who are these people is right there in the question they're people thanks mike um yeah i'd you know i'll go off that as as their people um I'd, I'd recognize that i think mike touched on mental health substance use i'd add trauma um to the mix of that because i think trauma really underlies most of the mental health symptoms um, or, or diagnoses or experiences, dispositions that people have, um, as well as the substance use. You know, I find that my privileged suburban upbringing is very different. I, I don't really meet any 
um, clients who had a similar kind of upbringing or amount of privilege that I had growing up. And so I find that my experience is very different from many of the people that I serve and that I made mistakes, but that um, my mistakes may not have been as costly or, um, or the environment that I was in um, may not have been as traumatic. Um, we know, what, what do we know about mental health? What do we know about substance use disorders? We do know that um, trauma is one of the key kind of things that, that feed into mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and what do we know about trauma is that it, it comes um, particularly in marginalized, in marginalized communities or folks who lack adequate and stable housing, lack adequate and stable supply of food and water. Um, and, and we think of those basic needs, but we also sometimes don't think about the emotional needs when we think of um, people that that lack stable caregivers that, that love them and that uh, allowed them choice and allowed them to feel comfortable in their identity and who they are. Um, I find that many of my clients are survivors of um, pretty adverse childhood experiences and, and childhood traumas too. And so when we think about um, how kind of a lifetime of traumatic experiences plays in, um, for some people, um, getting high is is a way to to cope with that and to deal with that. And um, they feel that the system has failed them and that it's a lot easier and safer um, emotionally and psychologically to continue using. And that, that might deal with the mental health symptoms more effectively. But then when they get high, then that predisposes them to more trauma, which predisposes them to more mental health symptoms or more severe mental health um, diagnoses or dispositions, which leads to more substance use, which leads to more trauma, which leads to more mental health. And so then that, uh, those three things kind of, I think is what really feeds into into it that, that gets these people um, stuck where, you know, they are where they are. They, they don't wind up at our door, um, like Mike said, by, by their own choice often, um, by very complex contextual factors that kind of led into them becoming who they are and where they are. Um, and that, that being both personal, familial, and systemic forces that I think um, get people there. And I think building on, and thank you both for, I think that really, really great explanation um, of those, you know, deep underlying vulnerabilities you know, that come into this and then pair that with a lack of affordability and, um, you know, just right, whether it be generational or, situ or situational poverty being, you know, one paycheck away from homelessness. I get 25 emails a day from mothers, from fathers, from single people, from, you know, people facing various different Levels, levels of vulnerability and different situations, whether it be an eviction or simply I can't afford my rent or um, my car broke down and I have no way to pay my rent because I need my car to get to work, you know? And then, uh, you know, this, the kind of vicious circle that they're speaking to, right, doesn't get any better with any of those kinds of things affecting you as well. Um, and they all just build on each other. So it's a really complicated issue. There's no one single cause of homelessness. There's no one single solution to homelessness either. Thank you all for, uh, for expounding on that. And I think going in that direction, um, we talked about some of the, you know, some of the, maybe some of the causes, uh, but I think you know, there's also a lot of things that you know, can, once their people are in there, make it more difficult for them to get out of and be more hurdles and such. Plus, there's a, there's a lot of challenges just that you know a community as a whole faces is trying to address these things. So I wonder. This is a very broad question, so take it however you want. But um, what would y'all say is uh, in each of you? Uh, what would you say is like the biggest challenge facing our, our entire community when it comes to addressing homelessness and really kind of finding a solution? I'll start and uh, say, there's <laughs> that is a loaded that is a big question. Um, you know, like like first off, I I, I would say that like a, an adequate supply of housing, and I I wouldn't just say housing, but I would say s deeply supportive and subsidized affordable housing. Um, whether the housing is affordable or whether we're utilizing programs with case managers doing like intensive kind of supportive case management. Um, to, to support folks with transitioning out of homelessness and into housing. Um, but what I find is that folks with, you know, who are kind of 
due to their disposition stuck in their kind of earning potential to like really low wage jobs that you know are not livable wages and not um, able to sustain fair market rent um, and then having a shortage of housing and not kind of building a lot more housing um, keeps those rents up and it also allows landlords to be picky and choosy I mean I find right now a lot of the folks where housing are, are when people get evicted um, we're, we're not finding vacant units to put people in we're finding that people get evicted and we're counting down the days until that eviction goes through so we can get our client housed and hoping for the best for this anonymous person who just got evicted to us as a caseworker. Um, so I would say deeply affordable, subsidized housing. I would also say with that, the safe housing um, in, a, in a lot of our housing programs, it's like, you know, we're going to house this person from the woods with a substance use disorder. And we're going to like, here's your chance. Like you got three weeks of sobriety and some supports around you. Like you're going to live in like three people on your hallway in your apartment complex are going to be selling drugs or alcohol and having, you know, people in and out, a lot of foot traffic in and out of their rooms. Like, how do we expect that person to, like, truly be successful? Um, or the person who gets $914 a month on Social Security disability income, like, how do we expect that person ever to live off that unless it's fully, you know, subsidized income-based housing? And, you know, we, we find that the, f the few landlords that are willing to work with subsidized housing, you know, market-based housing programs, um, they're, they get to be very choosy on who they take. And so the person with, you know, an aggravated assault in 89, you know, still can't get housed decades later, even if they're legally blind or have had a leg amputated or, you know, certain, dis you know, physical ailments that certainly prevent them from being the violent criminals that uh, their insurance companies may want them to prevent them from renting to. Um, one other thing I'll share and that we're hoping to do with the Athens Homeless Coalition is thinking through housing and uh, housing kind of programs or systems or supportive housing as not just a basic needs intervention, but also an emotional needs intervention and thinking through how do we build community um, amongst people who are transitioning out of homelessness with one another and with the entire community as a whole. Um, there's a lot of folks where it's like we, they're living, you know, trauma bonding and survival mode in rich community out in encampments, you know, albeit not the best community, but living amongst a lot of other people. And then we put that person with a substance use disorder and with a lot of trauma and with, you know, depression or whatever mental, you know, health stuff is going on alone in an apartment and with a case manager who's going to check in on them once a month, twice a month, or, or even weekly, um, and leave that person alone with their thoughts and no community, no sense of belonging, no sense of connection. Um, and I'll let Mike speak to this, but I know in the recovery community, they say that connection is the opposite of addiction. Um, so how do we apply that, that emotional need of how do we build connection amongst people um, transitioning out of homelessness um, to feel like they belong, like they matter, um, and to have those kind of social supports that I, I hope that we all have in our personal lives, um, but somebody transitioning out of homelessness may not have. Well, for the most part, and again, uh, I'm only 22 months into my own uh, new life, my own chance at, at rebuilding and uh everything's going rather well with it uh de definitely not saying that to toot my own horn but uh connection is the answer to addiction and it's the answer to, to just about every problem i've come across it's not just a connection uh with what you are trying to gain or the people that can give it to you connection with community connection uh with yourself holistically spiritually if that's if that's you know part of your belief system uh i find my answer with that that connecting as a peer and that's a tough word for me because uh growing up as a child i was my i was in adversity with all my peers sorry about that I should have silenced that. Anyway, um, you meet you meet people where they're at to find out what they need, and you give them the the best you've got to provide that within you know within your ability to do so. 
sometimes that's as simple as uh, giving them a smile and getting one back out of them. Sometimes it's day services. Sometimes it's helping with the problem of homelessness. And I hear uh, so much spoken to this concept of housing first where we work. And um, that's just like any other system in America from what I've seen that works as a system for those who can and will work it. But there's so many of them out there that for lack of that connection that you speak of don't have the desire or the will to do that. So going back to the question of what's the toughest issue, I think most of the time is that issue lies within the individual themselves, the, the gaining the desire for change. And how do we give them that desire for change, Mike? What's the answer to that? Dance fever. Dance fever. <laughs> <laughs> connection. Connection, though, is what was Connection is the, is the answer, always. And uh, y'all did such an amazing job of answering those two things. The only thing that I'll elaborate on is so the idea of housing first, um, which is something that they both said. So that's a um, something that if you're going to receive federal funding from the Department of Housing and Urban Development at a federal level, then your program or your service has to abide by something called housing first, which basically just means before we're going to say that you need to do A, B, C, and D to get to a better place or to get into recovery or, um, you know, to whatever that might be, then we are first going to say, well, first you need to be in a stable living situation so that those services will actually make a dip, you know, make, make some sort of, of difference because without the idea is that without stable housing, you just don't have the, I guess, you know, any I, ounce of comfort, right? You need that comfort to be able to then start actually making a dent in, um, you know, whatever your journey might be to, um, you know, pulling yourself out of that, of your, the situation that you were in. So that's the only thing I'll elaborate on. I appreciate uh, y'all bringing it up. And <clears throat> sometimes it's the, the biggest challenge is that obvious thing of uh, affordable housing to be the first, the first step. And with that, I tack on like, you know, if we're housing first is really hard in the status quo of a free market system where the only places that will rent to us are not very safe places for somebody who's not yet in recovery or who wants to get into recovery or who is in early recovery. There's so many people who we help transition and, you know, they've even even if they have several months of very, very, very hard work, then gets put where their neighbors are just going to like draw them right into into trouble. And so, you know, the, the model of housing first is includes a lot of case management, a lot of wraparound services, a lot of support, um, a safe environment, and a lot of connection. Yeah, and to cue that up, what I do every day is trying to find housing for these folks who are trying to desperately, who are doing the work trying to get it, but there's just not housing in our community. So I will use this time to pitch right now. You got an apartment, you got an Airbnb, you're renting a, or a house, you're renting something out, you want to be part of the solution? Talk to me afterwards. You'll have, we'll pay the rent, you'll get your utilities paid, you'll have case management with the people who are living there, we'll make sure that they are good tenants that get trained, you'll be part of the solution, so we desperately need that, so let that spread, please. Um, my little plug. Um, okay, so. There's, there's, there's a lot going on. I feel like right now there's, it's, it's a very busy time that our community is really taking on this issue, which is why, why we wanted to have this forum. There's a lot going on every, from different directions. So um, I'm going to kind of cue each of y'all up uh, to talk about something that your organization uh, is specifically working on. Um, so Lillian, I'll start with you. If you can just speak about uh, the ACC strategic plan that just passed recently and just uh, briefly some of the highlights of what we're hoping to get out of that as a community. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the strategic plan to reduce and prevent homelessness was passed at the beginning of October, and it has um, a little under five million in American Rescue Plan dollars attached to it that are going to be for different, we're calling them buckets, but different kind of topics of projects um, that we're going to put out RFPs into the communities or report 
request for projects, um, for these different kinds of projects. The st strategic plan had six goals with then 10 key strategies associated with those goals. One of the goals was strengthening the continuum of care, which John has spoke to, or strengthening um, the Athens Homeless Coalition specifically, acting as a, you know, a force for coalition building and advocacy um, and the ability to kind of unite different service organizations together and the community towards a common goal of reducing and preventing homelessness as well as you know other things like increasing funding into the community lots of different things but um, there's also a function of the strategic plan that involves increasing um, low barrier non-congregate shelter um, for folks um, there is let me just Use my cheat sheet because why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, there's also to there's kind of several things that involve um, doing kind of landlord outreach and support, but also increasing um, diversion and rapid exit out of homelessness, which involves getting people very quickly into housing situations that are you know perhaps these are more simpler cases to get people into those kinds of things, um, and. Yeah, if you have more questions about the strategic plan, it is on ACCGov. If you search acccov.com slash home, uh, strategic plan to reduce and prevent homelessness or acccov.com slash ARPA, um, you'll be able to see that strategic plan as well as the CDO that um, commissioners attached to the strategic plan um, that has a couple more things added to it as well. And, and Mike, I'll, I'll throw you, if, if you could, so as I've seen you at the day center, you've become like kind of the, the master like uh, bridge builder, connection maker kind of thing. Finding these different programs, different organizations, different employers that, that you've been able to make kind of partnerships with to be able to benefit our clients who are coming into the day center. Can you speak about a little bit about that, about some of the different organizations and entities that you've been working on just to partner with um, to help out clients? So the only tool I really have in any of this to help me with this, because I'm, I'm, I'm just winging it here, is lived experience. Uh, so I go with what I know, right? Uh, now, being a person in long-term recovery, I have a sponsor that I have worked my 12 steps with. Um, and he's out of the North Atlanta area. And he has an organization called Coming Home Ministries that is hooked up with hopelink.org for our clients that wish to try to get a grip on their chemical dependency, their substance use disorder. Um, we get them sponsored through that, through that uh, process, that application for their entry fee into a sober living environment. There are, at present, four different sober livings in the Athens and North Atlanta area that I personally know of that we have been able to get clients into drop of a hat. All they have to do is get a behavioral health assessment, just make sure there's no underlying uh, unattended to mental health disorders that might cause, uh, you know, cause them to, to, for lack of a better word, fail, uh, defeat them in their process, in, in their attempt. But, uh, Sometimes it's work. I've, uh, we've recently linked up with Staff Zone, and uh, Staff Zone is now uh, every morning, Monday through Friday, pulling into our parking lot at the Homeless Day Services Center at 10 after 5 a.m. to pick up any clients that wish to go and work for a day. Um, and normally their process is to come the first day, fill out the paperwork, show your documents, and what have you. Some of these clients don't have documents, so we help with that. I take them, uh, I, once a week, I take our clients to the uh, Department of Driver Services where Advantage has uh, uh, an ongoing, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, agreement to, to, to get them a, a state-issued photo ID. Staff Zone waves that first day of showing up. They say, look, if they show up with their documentation, we'll pick them up, bring them to work. We'll deal with that after the first day. Being in the rules for them a little bit. So we can get them into recovery. We can get them day labor. Uh, I don't know much about the housing that goes on in Advantage. It's just not my forte. Uh, got some really great people, hint, hint, that, that do that. 
but uh working on other other processes too but through that right there um they're getting and of course upstairs we got the nurses clinic attending to their medical needs uh we have i know that we've got ricky willis in the back he helps them get their uh, social security check started if if and helps them get insurance lots of times and uh supposed to be getting uh getting them taken to the eye doctor it uh coming soon too it's just there's different opportunities arising and the great part about that is is for every achievement we come to everything that we actually accomplish it opens the door for another one they see a success they want to be a part of that so they give us a chance for another one connection Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to talk just about one big development that Advantage has. I mean, we have a number of, of housing programs already, but you might have seen the mental health transitional like recovery facility um, that's been a, up for vote recently for some concept designs with um, the mayor and commission. So that's a roughly 60-bed facility of transitional housing for treatment specific treatment specifically, so for these folks to get them off the streets directly into a safe environment to receive like transitional housing and like treatment on site. We're trying to build it at 240 Mitchell Bridge where our current outpatient and inpatient facility is. Um, so I think that will be awesome. Right now we have a, a couple of transitional housing programs that are for people with pretty severe mental health needs. Um, that are housed in uh, master leased into some not great apartment complexes, which again makes it really hard for somebody in early recovery or who desires recovery to be successful when we put them, you know, in the lion's den per se um, at a couple of these apartment complexes that we just happen to to be able to have gotten some master leases with. Um, so I think that's a really exciting project in terms of being able to give people a like safe and like intensive co-occurring mental health and substance use. Um, transitional housing treatment program for some of those more kind of chronic um, and, and more intense, like higher level of needs. Um, but the issue with that is when they graduate, we will not have housing for them to go to because even when people do everything right with their treatment um, and with their caseworker and that we ask for them, it's still very difficult to find a lot of these people housing, whether their criminal background or again, their earning potential or their disability check. Um, or whatever kind of systemic limitations and the fact that, you know, if we do get them housed, it's probably because someone got evicted. Um, and that's I, that's really the status quo right now. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the Homeless Coalition and some of the efforts with that. If you've, again, I've, I've mentioned it already a little bit before, um, but really moving from, like, I think there's been a lot of good, you know, a lot of tension um, in the community and energy around homelessness in general. Um, and it's it's kind of all fallen on service providers' backs to be the, the primary kind of leaders of like doing this work. Um, but if it's a problem that does affect all of us, how can we create space um, for the entire community to collaborate, participate, be connected with one another, um, and figure out creative ways of like what skills, resources, perspectives, experiences, connections do I have? Um, that can help contribute to building a better tomorrow. Um, because whether you're a business owner who deals with um, the, the unhoused person that you don't want to have to bar get arrested from your property um, or who steals from you constantly while in, a, in pursuit of meeting their basic needs, or you're the landlord who, you know, ha one of your tenants, kids, or family members constantly comes and causes problems to the house, um, or, or you're, you're a concerned citizen about, you know, your taxpayer dollars, you know, seemingly not going to effective use or, or dealing with people coming to our community from outside of communities because our community is the closest one that has a shelter, that has a hospital, or that has um, some basic resources. These things aren't going to change um, if, we, if we complain about it or, or, or kind of point fingers at service providers. We're doing our best with what we got. Um, but if we ever want to make some change, it's going to take that community approach. Um, so, you know, I, I dream of a day that we're not arguing or talking over each other at City Hall on Tuesdays, but have, have actually sat at the table together um, a number of times and had some good roundtable discussions to come out what are some sensible um, steps that we can take um, step by step 
um, to, to make some progress. Um, one other thing, uh, I guess two other quick things, um, recognizing that people with lived experience of homelessness are the experts of their own experience, and we have a lot to learn um, from. Uh, I hope just just hearing from Mike tonight shows you, like I've learned so much from working with Mike and, and being friends with Mike, um, and I say that to a number of people who I know have a, an experience that's different from my own. So being willing to, to have humility and recognize that I certainly don't know it all uh, and, and probably never will, but I have so much to learn from people with different experiences from me. Um, and we as a community have a lot to learn from people with lived experiences of homelessness, uh, some of whom um, are living as our neighbors or coworkers or friends and we don't even know it. Um, so how can we have more honest dialogue to learn from one another and recognize and empower people with lived experience as the experts and, and leaders um, in building kind of this, this grassroots uh, community movement towards a, a better future. And the last thing is um, equitable entry into the continuum of services. Um, our status quo right now is that our, our service providers are overwhelmed and we have a lot of people outside of our door every day and deciphering how do I figure out who gets this, these limited resources is very difficult. And what I have found is that in our best efforts, um, our system, I guess, rewards the most able-bodied or able-positioned people to get housing. Um, and so, you know, it, there's there's certainly some kind of first steps we can take towards um, opening up uh, the access or doorways into our continuum of services um, that I, I do believe that the Athens Homeless Coalition can and should um, take charge in figuring out and doing. And, and also with the Athens Homeless Coalition, how do we, instead of just looking at our own com community and complaining about the people that are that are here um, or, or coming here from surrounding communities, how do we start to take more of a regional approach um, and build inroads with, with our neighbors and other communities? And I recognize that's uh, easier said than done. Um, but I, I certainly think that there's, and I've met with people in other communities that are good people and interested in how to help, but simply don't have the resources. So. How do we partner with, with people around us um, to, to better care for their own and, and better be part of the solution with us? Can I bounce right back off of that real quick? I just, I would, I, and I don't have the big words, you know, uh, but I will say this. I do have evidence of what has worked in my experience. You know, change comes in uh, big forms, but it starts in small seeds of hope. And if you meet an immediate need with one of these individuals in the moment, uh, a sleeping bag, a tent, that can spark up that connection that we keep talking about and blossom into change in such big ways. Street love, bigger vision, sparrow's nest. These are people with organizations that get involved every day. What about us that don't have organizations? I was in downtown about a month ago, walking by Little Italy, and uh, there, there's right next door to Little Italy, there's those two columns. The building looks like a bank to me. I don't even know what the building is. But I do know there were two individuals sleeping on the concrete there in the early morning on that Sunday. Cardboard underneath, nothing, nothing to cover up with. So I had an idea. And I started to go fund me. All I wanted was 50 sleeping bags, and I found them decent sleeping bags on Amazon, 10 for $110, buying in bulk. Before I was able to get, and I started to go fund me, I put it on social media, that demon. Before I was able to get the first 110 for the first 10 sleeping bags, I had one individual step in and buy me 40 sleeping bags. So I bought the other 10. We got the goal of 50. The leftover money w uh, went to buying snap lid containers for soap so that they could carry with them for these individuals that are leaving the uh, encampment. And now we have emergency fund Dollar General gift cards sitting at the day center for those individuals who need spur of the moment, you know, minimum cost, uh, you know, needs to be met. But what it boils down to is most of the time, the great distance between us and them can be diminished with a gift. Something as small as a bottle of shampoo, uh, 
again, a tent, a sleeping bag, or five minutes of your time. No. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for that. So. And, you, and you brought, and you brought up uh, the encampment. I think <clears throat> I have two more questions that we'll do that we're going to open up to the audience. And I think this one will be more for uh, Lily and John, but um, the first step encampment, I think most folks probably have heard that is being transitioning away. It's really hard to hear your question. Sorry. That the, the first step encampment is being transitioned away uh, by the, before the end of the year. And so I'm going to ask that uh, Lily and John kind of talk about where that's at and what our uh, hope is going to happen before the end of the year. So ACC Gov is working with, or the Housing and Community Development Department is working with Advantage and then um, our other organizations that do provide housing, whether that be emergency shelter, transitionary housing, or rapid rehousing in the community, um, to work with the individuals who are still staying at first step to transition them into a housing situation that's hopefully fit for them. As John said before, um, the funding for the hotel voucher program that was um, originally set out with COVID dollars is being um, continued beyond uh, the original contracted time to try to hopefully adapt um, to the situation and hopefully get some of those folks into, you know, a transitionary, you know, kind of housing situation that's not a permanent housing situation, um, and then hopefully continue to work with case management from there to get folks into something um, more permanent as well. Obviously, every individual that's staying at First Step is an individual, right? So they have individual needs um, that need to be thought about um, as we're putting folks, um, you know, into somewhere other than the tent that they've been staying in for however long. Um, but yes, our department is working to try to make sure that we get everybody into a safe um, place. It's going to be a hard couple months, y'all. Uh, to put it, to put it, I mean, just bluntly, and that how hard it is already for us to house the individuals that we already have in our hotel program that I've been trying desperately to get out of the hotel program and into housing so we can move first step residents out of first step and into the hotel and then into housing hopefully um, is very difficult. Um, that's just start by saying that. Um, I, I can say to in the past, I think three weeks, we've housed three people from first step and we got a few more hopefully with um, housing tracks, destinations, you know, starting to be worked out. Um, but again, the systemic kind of like forces the lack of, of act, you know, accessible or the, the lack of accessibility of like housing or vacant units, um, you know, kind of banking on people getting evicted. Again, I'll say it to, to get folks housed um, or banking on, you know, an indefinite timeline with the housing authority where I've done, you know, intake certifications and people are like next on the list and it's supposed to be like next 30 to 45 days and sometimes it is 30 to 45 days and sometimes it's for five or six months. Um, and so there are certain kind of things that it's, it's really hard to predict um, how many of those folks actually will leave first step um, to to the hotel or to, to housing um, by the end of that timeline. And so our team's doing, you know, we're out there doing case management, uh, working with folks, going outside of our regularly scheduled hours to be there to meet with people, um, trying to connect them to mental health supports, to behavioral health supports, to IDs, documentation, employment supports, all the things, throwing everything at the wall, trying to help people get whatever they need and connected to whatever they need, getting folks into recovery. A couple folks want bus tickets to reconnect with family. You know, we, we're, you know, we're trying to explore any and all possible steps in the right direction for, for people. Um, but the reality is that, um, already right now with, with, you know, first step aside with any, almost any of my clients, their best efforts put together with my best efforts, um, when there is that connection there, when there is that desire there, when people are doing everything that they can to help themselves, um, partnered up with me and our team doing everything that we can to help them isn't always successful. Um, and that's the status quo. And, and you know, this is kind of unrelated, but like when people say like, oh yeah, those people want to be homeless, those people choose to be homeless or those people 
Um, I asked people and they said they prefer to be homeless or live in the woods. I find that most of the people that say that are people that have tried a few times and found themselves unsuccessful and found it psychologically safer um, to say, I choose to be in the woods when it really comes from a place of hurt, rejection, and hopelessness. Um. And, and John, I think that leads into the last question that I had for y'all, which, um, and, and Mike, I'll, I'll start with you if that's okay, what it, which is, uh, what is, what is one misconception about people facing homelessness and homelessness in general uh, that, that you would like to correct? That, honestly, that question just got answered. Uh, the rock bottom line of it is, uh, after so much rejection, uh, the hope, you know, th these are lots of times very resilient people. They're survivors. Uh, they're overcoming a lot of the same things, a lot of the same disasters that we are, and then some, because to us, uh, loss of a wallet might be a pain in the butt. To them, it's an it's a complete restart of everything. Um, so honestly, I think the biggest I think the biggest thing I'd like to see changed. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much what John just said. Maybe maybe there's too many. Too many steps in the process, you know? Um, there's no immediate answers, y'all. So many people come in and ask for these imaginary vouchers. Or uh, even, within, even within Advantage, they're sent to us. Okay, so we've got your behavioral health assessment done. Now go to the day center and they'll get you housed. These people are coming in thinking that they're about to spend the night either in a hotel or in their in their own apartment. But there's so many hoops that have to be jumped through. Each and every one of these steps has conditions. So to be able to to go to get the behavioral health assessment, they have to have transportation to get there. Lots of times they can't take the public bus. They people make mistakes. But um it's just the small, the small little steps add up until finally you've got this whole mountain of, of obstacles in front of in front of you. And uh, what what can you do? That's a rejection in and of itself. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if that answered the question right. I'm nervous as a tick. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that uh, building off of that idea of that home, it's not always what it seems, right? Folks that you see are not always the only folks who are experiencing it as well, right? You've got a lot of kids who are experiencing homelessness and whether that be, you know, the homelessness as in on the streets or homelessness as in, you know, not a permanent house, right? That couch surfing that, you know, they don't have a, a permanent stable place to live every night. Um, you know, families living in their cars or, you know, people just on the brink of homelessness. As I said before, I, I can't remember the statistics specifically about what percentage of people are one paycheck away, you know, from experiencing homelessness themselves. So... I think that it's it's closer than you think. Um, the vulnerability is more widespread than you think, and um, it's a yeah, it, it, it's it's not a far way to fall sometimes. So um, yeah, I'm gonna go off that and some some stuff Mike said too about thinking about who who are these people and what does their day to day look like. And for a lot of people, like Mike said, these people are survivors, not just of their past traumatic um, and difficult experiences, but they're survivors of their present experience. Um, they're trying to figure out how to stay warm tonight. 
They're trying to figure out how to stay warm without burning down their tent tonight or getting the fire department called, which would lead to their camp probably getting shut down, which will lead to them moving 50 yards down the road and maybe losing their stuff depending on who the landlord was and how much time they want to give them to pack up their belongings and find another place to illegally camp at. These are people who are trying to figure out how to get over to Mitchell Bridge at 8 a.m. for a behavioral health assessment, uh, when in reality, if you get there at 8 a.m., there will be 10 people in line in front of you, and there's only the capacity to see two or three, but that's a step that they got to take to actually get mental health treatment or to see a clinician or to get prescribed medications or to get a diagnosis on file to, you know, to, to get into a supportive, permanent supportive housing program. Um, these are people who are trying to figure out how to get food. Um, these are people who are resilient and are survivors. Um, these are people who we like to look at as criminals, as crazy, as addicts, but these are people who uh, have to figure out a way to meet their basic needs. These are people who um, their their brain chemistry has has physiologically changed in response to the traumatic trauma that they've experienced. Um, that cause them to have maladaptive thinking patterns and respond to things that we would not understand. And we have to recognize that if somebody does something that I don't understand, they're, you know, they may seem irrational right now, but there is some physiological thing going on in their brain that's causing them to defend themselves in this way, where their fight or flight response has been activated and they're, they've gone into autopilot to protect themselves. Or these are addicts who, uh, you know, people with a substance use disorder who if they don't have that drink that day or get that fixed that day, um, they will be very sick and very angry and might turn into criminals or crazy for not having that. Um, and so as we think about that, um, I, I, you know, I, I wrote these words down and asked Mike if anyone had ever called him a criminal, a crazy, or an addict at any point in his life. And he said, absolutely. Yesterday. Yesterday, well, you know, I I like to think that Mike is someone that we might have one day called a criminal, crazy, or addict. Um, but I call Mike my friend, and I call Mike a leader in this community um, who's changing lives every day. So I'm thankful for you, Mike. So I found the words that I was looking for when I stumbled a moment ago, and it's really like this. Um, you know. For for any of us, and I'm going to use an I statement here. You know, I'm 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 a graduate and house supervisor at the sober living, for which I still remain. Um, I'm not ready to transition back out there into the rest of the world, uh, normal society. Uh, still trying to be a productive member from where I sit, and that's good enough for me right now. Uh, still seems like light years from the people I, I work with daily. Um, serve daily one mistake from being right there with them at any given moment and the words i think that i the, the, the stigma that surrounds them that i think i i, I think it would be the most important for me to see change is that they are hopeless cases lost causes the value of human life is no different whether you are living in the streets in a penitentiary, in a tent, in someone's backyard, on their couch, or in your own home. I know that because I have lived in every single one of those situations. I'm a son. I'm a father. I'm a brother. I'm a friend. I've even been an enemy. There was a time, yeah, <laughs> yesterday, no. <laughs> There was a time when I, uh, in my heavy addiction, where I was running from the police and taunting them, catch me, catch me if you can. And they did. <laughs> About an hour later. <laughs> but that's not the point I'm getting at. Um, running from the police, committing petty crimes, doing it uh, sometimes for survival, sometimes just because that's what my screwed up, chemically induced mind thought was the right decision at the time. Now, uh, I'm in a situation where daily, daily there is a 50-50 chance that I'm going to have to be calling the police to work with them, meeting with the district attorney's office for uh, different events, working with different RCOs and uh, sober livings, whereas instead of hunting for drugs, I'm now 
hunting for ways to get people that are hunting for drugs into a similar situation to my own. Again, I cannot stress enough the value of the seed of hope and of human life. That's So, so we're gonna open it up for uh, questions from the audience. For the last part uh, that we have here. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. so we really, I think, heard a lot about the very real challenges that we're all facing and how important and difficult they are. But what I'm curious about, we also have heard about the plan. The UG plan is described as it has been recently approved by the commissioners, and I wonder if there's some highlights of what is hoped and expected will be accomplished under the strategic plan that could make a significant difference in meeting some of these challenges. Definitely. So one, I think, of and, and something that your question kind of poses to is data, right? Data is something that we are kind of lacking in this area. It's a difficult thing to collect data on um, in a lot of ways. It's, there's, there's a lot of different systems kind of working together to capture data that are hard to bring together. However, one of the hopes of the strategic plan and some of the funding that we're putting towards is um, to have a better data collection system in place. And part of that could be through an employee of the Continuum of Care the or the Athens Homeless Coalition. Um, part of that could be, and, and you know, there's, there's some, there's options within that. Part of the strategic plan, I think, is that it's, you know, the idea of a strategic plan is that it's a starting point right? It is a means to create action from it. Um, there's a lot in this 90 plus page document, right? There's a lot of different, um, you know, facts and, and figures and, and ideas, right? But then we have to take actionable steps from those ideas. Um, and I guess I can speak to more specific kind of details of the plan if you would like, I can name more. Um, but uh, I think that's kind of like an overarching idea, I guess, of the starting point of where we're at with that. It's a starting point. It's not the solution in the 90 page document. It's a starting point. Yeah. Anyone in here a developer or have history building, um, building physical housing? Okay. Well, I don't know how many units we could build if we put all $5 million towards building housing units, but I can tell you it's not very many. Yeah. Um, and so when we, when we say that, like there's, I think that you're hearing us, you know, talk about housing as like one of the biggest kind of issues at the root of this problem. So there's very little that we can strategically plan to do with $5 million. Now the idea is that the strategic plan is more than just an allocation plan for the funding and, and is a longer term kind of plan for as a community. If we want to figure out how we need to get creative towards making an actual impact on building more housing, an actual impact on uh, building more community amongst people um, and learning from experts um, and building more connection, experts with lived experience and figuring out kind of like these longer term solutions. I think it takes our actual whole community coming together and starting to figure out what those kind of steps are to build more housing, support these individuals more, to make it so that we're not just housing people when people get evicted, but actually housing people because we have an adequate and safe supply of housing for people. Um, so really looking at what does it take to like create opportunity for there to be things that, that make that larger impact. Um, I don't think we've ever, you know, I've been following mayor and commission meetings for a few years now, and I, I very rarely see uh, a lot of people from different perspectives coalesce on any agenda items. So what would it look like if we all actually decided that what does success look like with the issue of homelessness? Does it look like getting people off our streets and into housing? Okay, what can we as a community do to take steps towards that goal? Is it that no one should sleep outside or that no one should be forced to sleep outside? Like what are our values as a community and how can we start to take tangible steps towards policy that 
that does that. I think we have really smart policy people. I don't know that they know a lot of people with lived experience. I think we have really concerned citizens that want to make sure no taxpayer dollars go to waste. How can we partner all of these different perspectives together to figure out what are those sensible solutions that will actually start to make a dent? And I would, I would point to key action items one, two, and three in the strategic plan to doing that, which is you know centered around the homeless coalition. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank y'all for your comments and your thoughts. Um, I have one comment and one question, if I may. Uh, I think our collective imagination around solutions is sometimes limited uh, by our societal like predisposition. You know? um, a lot of times when we think about addressing it, we think about it from a place of abundance or our abundance instead of like finding tangible solutions that have the greatest impact or greater impact. Uh, what I mean by that is like, I think there are some policies that could be explored uh, within reason, um, like with zoning, uh, zoning a specific area for a uh, certain density or type of housing, like pods. There was a professor from uh, out west that came and talked about uh, building pods. Uh, and they're like $5,000 a piece to build. Uh, what if we build a community center in the center of these pods that had bathrooms, running water, and that, that communal space, but then also had all these pods around it to get people out of the elements. And so we, when we don't think about those type of solutions as people are climbing the steps to get back into society, like how do we find organizations we can partner with that provides that uh, employment support that we talk about all the time? Like Mr. Moss, his, his story is so enlightening to me when he talked about applying for one position, not getting that position, but he was offered another opportunity. Like that, you know, goes so much uh, further than um, in terms of hope for a person to recover and be sustainable on their own uh, than, than just doing the other small tangible things, which are needed too. And this is not a critique of that. Because uh, we need those small tangible glimmers of hope but then at some point, we're gonna to need to offer people stable jobs at livable, livable wages, but that doesn't match with our politics. When we talk about politicians, we don't talk about that when we're talking about people who are experiencing homelessness. And so uh, my question would be though to like, when, when we start to put out these RFPs, like when we start to apply for these projects, like uh, what are some of the things that you would like to see um, in terms of solutions. And like, even when you think about ARPA dollars, like, is it allowable use of ARPA funds to build a structure that somewhat manages, you know? Like, is anybody like submitting those type of projects related to this form? Um, so the RFP process, we're still in the process of developing um, the language and the, um, I guess, what those will look like, right? And the specific different buckets, um, the descriptions for what we're, what we're asking for. However, I can speak to, specifically, I have been approached by several nonprofit developers that develop tiny homes and, um, you know, the pot, like, they're, they're made of, um, like, you know, old shipping containers, you know, those kinds of places. And um, they've worked in communities where that's been very successful. And, you know, I am, I say, that's really cool. You should look out for when we put our RFP process out, you know, and be, you know, and um, I can't necessarily, you know, I'm not saying that your project will be chosen, but it sounds really cool and you should definitely submit something like that, right? Um, and, you know, we put them on our nonprofit server list and we encourage them to look out for when those funding opportunities come about. Um, one of them is called the, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget it. I will look it up and I will find you and I will tell you what it what the name of it is I've been approached by like two or three and they've had great success stories and whether it be from you know specifically tiny homes or rehabilitating you know old hotels or old apartment buildings that have been vacant and you know dangerous for years and years and years right and then developing them into livable spaces that are not just you know short term but long term a lot of the times for folks permanent supportive housing kinds of situations so there's definitely those folks out there who want to do those kinds of projects and who are aware that um, you know Athens is an opportunity for them 
appreciate the uh, the comments and the the feedback and question there, Broderick. Um, I think that when we think about how do we develop and push forward creative solutions. I think that's the hope of coalition building, um, particularly when I say recognizing people with lived experience as the experts on this matter, um, recognize that they have, they can tell us where they slip through the cracks time after time after time after time again before being successful, or people with living experience can tell us where they're still slipping through the cracks. Um, I find in street outreach, hanging out with people in the woods all day, uh, five days a week, uh, my clients have some great ideas, like absolutely great ideas in terms of what if we did this and it would be really cheap and people could um, could just do it this way or this way and we could, you know, we don't need all that stuff that y'all want to try to do. Like we just need this or, um, and, and those are ideas that I feel like I, I feel this dilemma of like, I almost feel like I'm a gatekeeper of good ideas because they just kind of, I'm just the person they share their ideas with because they think I can just make things happen, I guess. Um, but how do we create space for those people to be included in the dialogues? I, I can think of at least one, uh, I think it was either a homeless coalition meeting or like kind of big homeless listening session. And I think, well, there's, there's two. There's one where I knew six people in the room were currently experiencing homelessness and five walked out within 30 minutes because of the way the discourse was going um, and some dehumanizing kind of language about them. There was another dialogue that I was in that after we spent 90 minutes talking about housing and homelessness, uh, the only person in the room who was actually currently homeless raised their hand and said, so what are y'all gonna do about housing and homelessness? And so clearly there are problems with our discourse and the ways we're having our conversations if the people actually affected by the policies we're talking about are not able to participate and are asking, what are y'all gonna do about this after we spent 90 minutes talking about it? So um, with that, I think also finding, clearly it's a problem that everyone's mad about. So how can we all work together to identify solutions that kind of meet all of our kind of perspectives. Because I, I found that there's a lot of value to people that I would have, a lot of people that I would have thought, I will never agree with you on anything. We have totally different perspectives. I found that by spending time with these people, by talking with these people, that there's actually a lot of things we do agree on. And there's a lot of sensible first steps we can take um, in building our relationship and finding genuine, true, effective community solutions that are cost effective, that involve people with lived experience to tell us why it will or won't work and what to prioritize and help us fix it when we do have problems with it. So um, again, I would say coalition building really really is, is my answer to that. When you ask the panel what was the one word that would describe sort of the issue, I thought to myself it would be volume. We have so many people and a limited amount of services. But as a per capita center of services, and Clark Penny has, has got a lot of services. But we're just seemingly overwhelmed by volume. And, and so I think they actually feed on each other because of the generosity of the community and the success of good people who are in it. That success breeds more. At least that is at least one of the perceptions in the community. But if we get better at this, we'll have more people. And there are evi there's evidence of that in some communities, Portland, Oregon, maybe the West Coast, etc. So how do you deal with the volume, which is due to the success, and not breed more volume? I just, I, I want to touch on that concept of volume. It's, the homeless situation is no different than the recovery scene in Athens. It's not only volume, it's condensed volume. So you've got lots and lots of these uh, situations in such a small area. What we need is more involvement. We need more shelters. We need more, we need more bigger visions, more street love, more sparrows nest because uh, right now, I'm thinking at the end of the day, we've got Salvation Army and Bigger Vision where they can stay the night. Look in your bad and busted. The criminal trespass rate has gone way up. 
And I'm giving you right now an honest 80 to 85% of those people are our clients. So I appreciate the the question and the concerns there about volume. I think you and I share that frustration of there's nothing, I, I guess it, it's really overwhelming and frustrating to have people who aren't Athenians um, with that are human beings that have intense needs, medical, mental health, housing, income, like all the things um, wandering our streets because they just showed up here um, because they heard that Athens had housing or had great services. So I do think that there, that is certainly by nature, I think of being a city and by having two hospitals, we're never going to not um, have unless we want to stop being a city or stop having hospitals. So it's going to keep happening. And unless we start to figure out ways to mitigate against it and build it up. And so when I think of whose job is it to go out and build relationships with our surrounding communities or to meet with hospital discharge planners in Gainesville and in Monroe and in Barrow County and in all these different places, I've met with hospital discharge, discharge planners at these hospitals by the way, and they um, they are people who are like, well, I have a client and I can't just discharge him to Quick Trip. Um, this is a person who came to me from another community because we were the closest hospital that uh, was an emergency receiving facility for a 1013 for a psychiatric patient for someone who wanted to kill themselves that day and was at imminent risk of harming themselves. So that person winds up in the ER uh, or winds up in their behavioral health unit. They, they make it through their stabilization seven day stay and then they get to the end of that stay and the hospital discharge planners legally, you know, can't just send them, send that high risk for suicide patient to the quick trip or to the McDonald's or wherever they came from, even if that's what they want. And so they send them to the closest shelter that they can secure a bed at, which usually is bigger vision because bigger vision is night by night. So if, I don't know if anyone here knows how bigger vision started, but it started from, from some church folk who wanted to let some people stay in their, their church overnight. I'm sure, I know there are great people in Jackson County and in Barrow County and in Walton County who want to help and don't know how. I know there's people in those recovery communities who want to help and don't know how. We, um, we may not, you know, build as large of a social service scene or help build as large of a social service scene in those communities, but I met with the street outreach lead in like seven different counties. One dude covers seven different counties up in Hall County, Gainesville, all, and then Habersham and all those counties. And he's like, we have nowhere to put people. We have no shelters and they want it. They're eager for help, but they don't have ways of uh, competitively applying for grants or, or, you know, coalition building in their own communities to figure out what they can do. So I hope that Athens can be a model of coalition building. And then we can take that model and meet with uh, community leaders in these other communities. Because right now, it's no one's job to go and do that work. We're all mad about it. But someone needs to be responsible to go out and help support some of these surrounding communities to take that more um, regional approach, I would say. And I'll also just share that in the status quo, a large number of the individuals we are housing is outside of Clark County because we simply do not have housing here. Um, so a lot, a lot of the times I'm facing my client, some of whom are lifetime Athenians or have been here for a, you know, a decade, and I'm telling them, hey, the only place we can find for you is in Barrow County or is in Jackson County or is in um, Macon or, or Augusta for some people for our Georgia Housing Voucher Program. And... Some of them, it's been fine, and they've moved there and been great. And other of them, they go there, and they have no connection, and they spiral, and they do very poorly, and then they find themselves either back homeless in Athens or homeless in that community, too. I know that's not really an answer, but the status quo is bad, and we need to do something about it. Just real quick, I think that also, you know, it's important to say that this is not a, and as you said, right, of that we're, you know, we see examples of places where it seems like because there's more services, then there's more people, right? But this is a national issue. There's people in every single state, in every single region, in, you know, every single large metropolitan area of the country that are experiencing homelessness and then communities that are experiencing the effects of increased homelessness in their community as well, right? But, you know, Athens is not only a, you know, a, a hub for service providers, but it's also a hub for culture, for education, for art, for, uh, you know, a myri sports, exactly, a myriad um, of other things, which 
you know, the, the connection there is that people want to come here for many different reasons. And even when you're in a vulnerable situation, like experiencing homelessness, those things are still, a, you know, a, a, a plus in your reasons to come somewhere. Okay, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll also say, like, we're, like, you know, advantage here is the community service board for a 10-county area. That's state designated. There's, what, 20 community service boards across the entire state. So we actually are required by the state constitution to accept people suffering from mental health, addiction issues from a 10-county area, and they come here. So part of all this is by design. And that's, that's implemented by the state just because it's the best way to be able to implement services. But I also say, I, I, I've been able to work with three clients that are getting housed this week. One of them was from Oconee County. They're going back to Oconee County to house here. One of them was from Walton County. They came here, they're going back to Walton County. So uh, I think the idea that somehow that we're, like, we're, we're keeping them all, everybody here, it's, it's just not true actually in the practice of us serving folks. I didn't say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I appreciate the question. Then. Um, so uh, we just have time for three quick questions. I'm going to go Gwen, uh, Seth, was there anybody? Okay, yeah, ma'am, back. Okay. We'll do four, four quick ones. If we can do it quick. Everybody keep your questions quick, keep your responses quick. All right, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to sound like the most heartless person here because I know the wonderful job that John Morris and I don't know Mike, but I know what they're doing because we've worked with them through our park. The Cobham Triangle has introduced us to an overflow of people who are probably using the sparrow's nest and then um, use our park. And uh, we have very little problem because we pay a daily guard. But I'm just wondering if in addition to uh, these wonderful things that y'all are doing, but we recognize the time period that it's going to take to build housing, to solve the housing problem, to, to create a, a, a culture that's able to give them immediate response and take out some of those conditions that are, nobody can get that. Anyway. But I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can take some of that money or some of our energy and as a local problem, clean up the trash the, the symptoms of this, like around North Avenue, um, where near a new vision. Uh, it's, it's horrible. It's insulting them. It makes, it creates a very negative feeling in the community. And we see that all along the Greenway. Our Greenway is just polluted. And I'm just thinking that really there should be some way, I think, where our, the results of the problem are alleviated from the rest of the community while we're solving the problem. And that's just the question I have. I'll just answer that briefly, Gwen. I appreciate the question. Um, it's it's difficult. There's trade-offs to everything we do, right? Like if we if we clean up that trash. Uh, and, and clean it up every day, then people leave more trash, and then we spend more money cleaning it up every day. Um, but then there's also the issue of if we want to put trash cans on homeless camps that are not sanctioned, then uh, the landowner might get frustrated that we did that without their permission and want to pursue legal action for such uh, activity. Um, if we, you know, anything that we do to try to like implement this, ends up having some kind of negative consequence. So like if we spend, I guess I guess it's, you're right, it's, it's complex and it's hard to do. I, I appreciate the Sparrow's Nest for having their program where they pay folks to, you know, go around the city and, and help clean up, but I don't know that it's, it, it's, that it's like making a, I wish Jamie were here to talk more about it, but, um, you know, with homeless camps, it's like, do we really expect this person to like, like one of the biggest supplies we give is like trash bags so people can bag up their trash. We met with a community educator with a fire department today about, all right, well, like, you know that the only clean homeless camps are the ones where people are burning like really, you know, toxic trash into their fire pits. And so like, do we really expect that person to like bag up their trash, like haul it like a quarter mile or half mile out of the woods to illegally dump it in someone else's dumpster where they might get a, you know, in trouble there. 
it's hard. I don't have the answer to that question. I think it's a good one to think about and consider. And I hope that there's some uh, smart people with lived experience that may have good ideas about um, what we could do to mitigate against the trash accumulation in the community and, and help beautify our, our city. Thanks, John. Uh, it's, it's us. It's this community. We're the ones who pick up the trash. We're the ones who make our community better. Like, what are we going to do about the homeless problem? We can talk all we want, but it's all of us. This group of people in here and all our friends and all our networks and all people we know, we make it better. We don't rely on the feds to do anything. We don't rely on anybody else from any other county to do anything. We do it. Please. We've got to fix this. It's ridiculous. It's insane. We live in the richest country in the world. And we have people living on the street with children who don't eat unless they go to school. That's ridiculous. We should be ashamed of ourselves. And with the, what, hundreds of thousands of uh, incoming refugees from other countries and the fentanyl crisis on top of that, I have to agree. I'm proud of you, Mike. Stay the course. Thanks, uh, uh, Yes. Last week I attended, I remember, I don't know if you remember me, but I had made a suggestion on assisted living. It's basically for mental health. You take a location, you then renovate it, one of the warehouses where you renovate it into sections of apartments, studio apartments, and here's the thing. You get the grants, the grants renovate, well, you start from the city building. It's called eminent domain. You take the freaking building, you get a grant, you renovate it. Then what you do is you use the Social Security, you use the Medicare and the Medicaid for cover this. This has been done in New York for over 30 years. I'm just down here nine years and I'm watching this. And it's for the mentally ill. If you can just pull that section out, it will leave you with more resources to deal with the rest. Now, I ran into someone that was at the meeting and they said that you guys were seriously considering it. I hope you do. Because what happens with living assistance, one, they're able to go and come as they please. They're able to have their own apartment. They also have medical assistance there. So if they're on medication, they are responsible for taking medication. It's part of living there, okay? They have a cafeteria environment, so there is your community. They also have events and things that they can do, you know. And they can stay there permanently until they're older, and then they transition into a nursing home. And the reason why I know this is because my grandmother lived that way for about 20 years. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and she had to be medicated. Without it, she was lost. The agreement is, you live here, you have a nice well. They had um, two bedrooms. You had to share, you know, two bedroom apartment, but or, or two bedroom room. But it was done, and they were successful at it. And here's the thing: Athens doesn't have to. You don't have to get grants to continue, to continue, to continue. The, the initial grant investment is to renovate. It's a city property taken over, renovated, and then the Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid pay the rest. And it's continual. I think that's an excellent, excellent idea. And, and I think the legalities of figuring that out, it, clearly New York can do it. I'm curious to figure out what it takes to figure that out. To yeah, yeah. So like I'm, I'm all on board, like Advantage would be who would run something like that because we already are billing Medicaid or state contracted services for mental health services already to have that sustainable source of income. So I think that that is a, a, an excellent idea and that we as a community, right, like what does it take to actually see a project like that to life? It takes a lot of people making a lot of noise about brainstorming, figuring out, coming together, figuring out all the details. So it's a polished proposal. and a lot of people at City Hall to make sure it gets pushed through whatever it takes. So as a coalition, as a community, we can come up with great ideas like the one just shared and then actually take steps to advocate for it and to make sure it's a polished proposal when it goes before the government or before the powers that be that would typically prevent something like that. But it, it, it takes thinking about it, brainstorming it, figuring it out, and then all showing up, you know, saying we believe in this as a, as a tangible next step. It's the very last question uh, for the student. So, can you elaborate for the audience, please, how significant 
and GAPS in terms of your housing efforts and on the fact that it is transferable with the client throughout the state of Georgia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those who don't know, Susan's referring to the Georgia Housing Voucher Program. I'm sure all of you have heard of Section 8 or the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is a federal program. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially subsidized housing vouchers um, where, where individuals pay 30% of their income as their rent. Um, it is, com, you know, free market based where once people get that Housing Choice Voucher, they go out um, or Section 8, they find a landlord that's willing to work with it. Um, that landlord takes them and they renew their lease. They pay 30% of their income. The state pays the rest of the rent. Um, rentals have to be below the fair market uh, value. Um, so I'm getting there. So GHVP is like the state of Georgia's version of that for people that have a diagnosed severe and persistent mental illness um, and then meet another qualifying criteria. So uh, severe and persistent mental illness, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera. Um, they have that, they have functional life impairments, and then they also are either chronically homeless, have exited jail or prison in the last 90 days, um, have been hospitalized three or more times in the past year, um, or 10 or more times in their life. So specifically these high needs individuals. Um, and so it, it is a huge part of who we are housing and the number of people we are housing because housing choice vouchers just had like nearly 200,000 people apply in the four day or week that they were open and only like 13,000 people, I think I read in the news are going to get it in our state. Um, but Georgia housing voucher is almost an endless supply, at least as of now, um, where we are constantly referring people who are able to make it over to Mitchell Bridge at 8 a.m. to get that behavioral health assessment done and be one of the first three of 10 people in line to actually get it done, then make it to their follow-up appointments, engage in that mental health um, outpatient treatment. Um, so it has become a huge, a huge, huge, huge part of our housing track. And uh, like Susan mentioned, it is across the state. So Advantage covers the entire DBHDD Region 2 with that program. So we cover from Macon to Augusta. And when I referred to housing clients in Macon or in Augusta because we can't find them housing here, that's the program I'm talking about housing them on. All of our other programs are within our 10 county region that Tim alluded to. Um, but it is a widely, I think, very successful program um, in terms of like when I think of like how am I housing that chronic person who's been on the streets for years and has had lots of barriers and is never going to jump through all the hoops to make it through one of the, I, I guess, are kind of typical, more typical housing tracks. Over the past year and a half, we have... Um, really what since we since we took over Georgia housing voucher for our region have seen dozens and dozens and dozens of households or individuals who are the most high needs get into housing again the issue there though because it's income based um, but the issue there though is finding landlords that will take the program um, and finding landlords that will you know that will take the person right they may take the program but if they get 50 applicants for their like three apartments you know, they're not, they can easily throw out the people with the felonies, even if it's 30 years old, they can throw out the people with whatever kind of, they pick and choose who they want, right? And then on top of that, the units that they have available, I cannot stress this enough, are when someone gets evicted. And so even people that are getting housed on Georgia housing voucher in our community and our surra immediately surrounding communities are often because they are evicting the person before. And that person becomes and fills a unit where that person has now, hopefully not become homeless, but more than likely has become homeless or couch surfing or whatever. Okay, thank you. I'll see you we've, got, we've got it, we've got it, and I have to go with a six-year-old to bed, y'all. Uh, <laughs> it's my night. Uh, so uh, thank y'all. I think there's things that all of us can do here. Uh, the Homeless Coalition is doing lots of community engagement, taking board members tonight nice to last night. Uh, the day center desperately could use more volunteers and, and, and just contributions going there. Coordinated. There we go, coordinated. Yeah. Don't just show up. So work with Mike, contact Mike. And then uh, as Louis put, we have the the, um, the strategic plan is on the website. There's lots to dig into there so we can have more understanding and be able to plug into that RFP process, especially if you have great ideas to be kind of fleshing those out. That's where those ideas will be inserted into the RFP process. So uh, just please, everybody, give a, give a round of applause to these fantastic